satisfying to the human soul. And it is Egypt, along with the other civilizations as well, the other ancient civilizations, but it's Egypt that we have access to. It's Egypt that in going through their temples and tombs and studying their pyramids, we get a living sense of how human beings, civilized human beings, once behaved. The science of perfecting of consciousness, the secret creation of the permanent and highly valuable philosopher's stone, this magical and arcane knowledge seems to perpetually fade from view, only to burst into incarnation again. Truly, this is one aspect of the powerful symbol of the phoenix, continually rising from its own ashes. At the temple of Karnak, the organic cycle of life is represented through the symbolism of the seed, which produces a tree that bears fruit, containing the seed for the next cycle. This relief may show the teachings and revelations of the past to be in their own way bound to the Osirian cycle of death and rebirth. The presence of the great teacher Thoth, the god of numbers and language, of thinking itself, links these teachings to a cycle seen in organic life. Thoth's deep wisdom found bloom in the pharaoh who was then able to write his own name in history. Karnak is itself a beautiful symbol for this cyclical rebirth, this perpetual unfolding of the sacred traditions and the secrets of magic. As the torch was passed to each new generation, the temple grew and evolved along with them. In each generation, the teaching would again flourish. The knowledge itself seems alive and subject to seasons of fertility, as well as long periods of hibernation. Throughout history, we see its cyclical re-emergence and its evolutionary influence on man. ancient secrets of personal becoming, the mastery of circumstance, of the creation of a perfect vessel for immortal consciousness. The ancient secrets are often said to be lost to history. But if one knows where to look, the ancient secrets still burn brightly. The secret and ancient technology known throughout history as magic, seems to direct us to the transformation of lower or base materials into higher, charcoal into a diamond, lead into gold. But since the beginnings of transmission of these secrets, their most precious application was to the materia prima of consciousness itself, our attention, our awareness, our intellect, our inspiration, our intuition, individuality. It is the materia prima that most take for granted. It is widely wasted, largely overlooked, and hardly regarded. The 
The same laws that govern the perfection of the material world apply to the world of intellect or consciousness. We can create a diamond out of ourselves by following the same rules that apply to the perfection of any external material. This is one aspect of the deep secret of the Philosopher's Stone, the transmutation of our consciousness into an object of perfect, compact structure, high value, virtual impenetrability, and lustrous permanence. The body is the, is the temple in which the work takes place, and what does the work, or what has to do the work, is the con. In other words, that's our personalities. We have to decide, that's our decision to make, whether or not we want to just mooch our way through life doing whatever it is that we do, or involve ourselves in this transformational process uh, that has a quite distinct um, goal in mind. And the goal, of course, is a very lofty one, but each of the steps is, each of the steps has to be, each step has to be accomplished before the next step takes place. And for those who are engaged upon this path, that becomes the all-absorbing focus of, of a lifetime lived. And it, it really depends. That's our decision. We're not obliged to do this. Um, in the sense we are, because uh, if the Egyptians knew what they were talking about, and the, the Cobb, the deceased, is judged on the, in, the, in the judgment hall of Osiris, if we don't do it, um, we suffer the consequences. And if we do do it, we reap the reward uh, commensurate with our work and uh, where we go. And this is, again, this is formal in, uh, in Christianity as well. Practically everything in doctrinal Christianity can be related to Egypt. And, uh, when Christ gives the parable of the sower and, um, not, sorry, the parable of the talents, he's talking about talents there being a, a weight of silver, not a talent of music or baseball, or that sort of thing. But they're related in a way, and that if you're given ten talents, or if you're, if you're born with, you're you have five talents bestowed upon you, um, you're expected to make ten of it, and if you have two, you're expected to make four of it, and if you have one, you're supposed to make two of it. It's not necessarily mathematically correct, but the parable gives the idea, and in, in the parable, the, the Lord leaves, um, God leaves, the, or the landowner, whatever it's expressed, the, the, the rich landowner leaves having bestowed these talents upon his servants and he comes back sometime later and the one with five has made ten and the one with two has made four and uh, the, the, the landowner compliments them on their work but the one who has just been given one said he recognizes that the landowner is a is a is a is a, is a cruel master and so he's buried his talent and done nothing with it and the landowner banishes him to the to the outer regions and says something like, O oh, thou unprofitable servant, from those that hath shall be given, and those that hath not shall be taken away, even that little which they have. Some words to that effect. So this is this is basically the Egyptian doctrine re-expressed in Christ's parables. So this is I mean that's the those are the rules. You um, you're given a certain everybody is given something to work with he or she who doesn't do the work suffers those consequences and we're in the middle of the, we're in the middle of the society where not only are few people doing the work but the validity of the work itself is denied by precisely the people who actually run the system what is intelligence thoughts who may be in every way the father of thought, is portrayed as a god or netter to demonstrate the bundle of functions and associations we commonly think of as intelligence or consciousness. He is the purveyor of patterns, of organization, of hierarchies. He not only represents thought, but his teachings are the systems of optimizing thought. He is the embodiment of all the aspirations of the mental faculties. The many nilometers employed up and down the Nile 
showed a very developed science of measuring and predicting the rise and fall of fertility of the land. Each temple had a Nilometer, um, and in flood season it was connected to the Nile. I'm not sure exactly how, but whatever the, whatever the flood level was, it would, it would come into the Nilometer and the stairs are carefully calibrated, X number of digits. And whatever level it came up to allowed the priests, told the priests exactly what the harvest was going to be. You knew exactly what the, what the flood was going to be and that determined the harvest. There's no rain to speak of or, or at all for years and years and years. So this tells them it's taxation in advance because they can levy, they can levy the taxes according to what they know given you know, unless there's a plague of locusts or something of that sort, they know exactly what they're going to get from the level of the Nile. And because the level of the Nile is different at various sites, depending on the width of the floodplain and the number of other factors, they need a Nilometer at each precinct or each gnome to be able to tell them how much water for that particular area. So this is a pretty matter-of-fact looking one. When we get to Komombo, there's a very spectacular, beautiful, round, deep Nilometer. The Egyptians understood the laws of cyclical fertility so well that they could predict the crop rates by careful measure of the level of the Nile at key points in the yearly cycle. Is it possible that the Egyptians also observed a science of predicting the rise and fall of intelligence throughout the day? The longer cycle of the months and years and the grand celestial cycle of the Yugas? They may, in fact, have left a record forever reminding us that our intelligence and our consciousness rise and fall like the tides, like the eternal cycles of wakefulness and sleep. Once we begin to look, we become aware of our daily fluctuations of consciousness or awareness, of low blood sugar source, of peak times, of on times, times of maximum creative yield we begin to become aware of the high and low tides of our capability, our strengths and weaknesses, in flux throughout the day as we pass through the decades. Our thoughts, our minds, ourselves, our awareness, our personalities are different at different parts of the day. This can in part be related to the ebb and flow of electrolytes, endorphins, adrenaline, serotonin, and other neurotransmitters, but what determines the cycle that causes their rise and fall? The ancients indicate that consciousness is influenced by external forces, and in fact, they even originate outside of us. The ancient model holds that the consciousness we experience exhibits a resonance for certain astral bodies. Some texts go as far as to identify a specific star as the source or the wellspring of the universal consciousness we all participate in. It seems obvious that intelligence and mental focus of a higher concentration of consciousness is necessary for the carrying out of magical work. As the land was made fertile or subject to famine according to the rising and falling levels of the Nile, perhaps the fanatical attention to the heavens was evidence of the tracking of mental, intellectual, intuitive and magical fertility charted and observed, rising and falling in strength in a cycle corresponding to certain stars. Is this one of the secrets behind the precise astronomical alignment seen at so many of the sacred sites?
When we recognize the fluctuating nature of consciousness, it is then possible to undertake the study of how we can perfect it, optimize it, amplify it, maximize it, use it to construct the stone. The Arabian name for Egypt was Kemet, meaning the black land. Alchemy was originally known as Al-Kemet, or from the black land. It was a magical practice that was so carefully guarded that its steps were shrouded in allegory and riddle. It was communicated through metaphors about transformation, or more specifically, transmutation. It described the alchemist's quest to collect the materia prima and to subject it to a series of exacting purification processes. If performed correctly and with great attentiveness on the part of the alchemist, the materia prima would become transmuted to a higher state. Yes, well, the word, the word alchemy, um, is, there's arguments over this, there's arguments over everything, actually. But alchemy probably derives, it's an Arabic word, with alchemit, um, the Egyptians called their own country, Kemet, the black land. And, um, and so alchemy becomes the art of the, or from, of the black land. And it is, I think, a, a, a direct or an indirect transmission of, of, an of an Egyptian doctrine. The mystery schools had more or less died out, you could say. Anyway, there certainly wasn't a whole society devoted to developing uh, a, a caste of initiated priests, but alchemy was a way of doing it on your own, and it was even if frowned upon by the church, by the formal institutionalized church, it was permitted because they all thought they'd get gold out of it. Uh, but the gold, of course, so that the alchemists produced may or may not have been real gold, since we now know that uh, it is, in fact, possible to transmute uh, elements from one to another. We do that with our atom bombs, but that's hardly gold. And um, so this, this um, practice was, was permitted by the church, and um, Schwaller himself, of course, was an alchemist. And he, he talks about those who are simply interested in the physical process and hope to produce gold, and those who understand that the actual production of gold, if it is indeed possible, I think it is, actually. I think there are enough accounts of the alchemists that are not folderol and that are eyewitness, you might say. And yes, you can't test the witnesses anymore, but I, I, I think it's... I think it's in principle possible that they actually succeeded in what they were doing, but the production of the gold was like passing a test. I mean, that, that told you that you'd acquired the Philosopher's Stone and you had reached a certain level of internal development. The value of creating alchemical glass or alchemical gold may seem more obvious. One might ask, what is the benefit of applying the alchemical steps to consciousness? At the beginning of the show, we discussed great minds throughout time that were made great, who were able to write their names in human history as a result of discovering and internalizing these secrets for themselves. But beyond the myriad benefits that a higher consciousness and a greater intelligence might have in the physical life, the pyramid texts offer a clue as to their greatest value. The alchemical steps bear a remarkable similarity to the stages of transformation depicted in the funerary text of what is in the duet. It depicts the highest use of alchemy, the creation of the perfect vessel, that will carry one across the Nile through the hours of the duet, across the great threshold of transformation to the afterlife. Scenes of the Book of the Amduat, the Book of what is in the Duat, the netherworld or the beyond, or the, the state of consciousness that succeeds or that follows death. In the, in the tombs of the early kings of the New Kingdom, these are depicted in 
magical or on magical papyruses and rather in cartoon form as bewildering stick figures. Later in the New Kingdom, the pharaohs decided for reasons of their own to turn these texts into, um, into a more artistic form and to carve them in reliefs into the walls of the tombs. Tomb of Seti I, now closed to the public uh, because of severe geological subs subsidence, has been closed for some 17 years and probably will continue to be closed to the public. But this is perhaps the high point of Egyptian funerary art in the, in the New Kingdom. And here we see the same representations that we see in the tomb of Tutmosis III, but realized in fabulously artistically rendered uh, three dimensions carved into the walls, but the end result is rather peculiar in that the initial effect when you walk into those early tombs is one of high magic. Um, in the later tombs here, for example, um, the effect is more artistic. In other words, we're in the we're in the in the company here of of, of virtuoso artists, um, and it's less obvious that they're magicians. But it is, they are exactly the same text, and the representations are variants of the same, of the same teaching. When consciousness works on itself, perfects itself, takes itself through the alchemical steps, it becomes the stone. And this is the vessel used by the deceased when navigating the duet. This is the seed or the egg, which hatches into a higher incarnation in order to act on its own behalf to gain mastery over the machinery after them. This is why the priests and initiates spent each day in constant service of constructing the perfect stone. The perfection and crystallization, the condensation of the will, the attention, consciousness. The finished process created the philosopher's stone, the diamond out of charcoal, lead into gold. It was believed then as now that work done in life to perfect, to congeal, to make permanent the consciousness would prevent a dissolution and evaporation or breakdown of consciousness in the afterlife. The consciousness that remains in an imperfect or incomplete or charcoal state is easily broken down, dissolved by forces of separation that one passes through the threshold of death. And as the years rolled by, and I had the opportunity to be an initiator and, and an officer uh, in uh, these initiation ceremonies, some of them overtly magical in nature, uh, things started to, to, to put themselves together about what the initiatory um, structure really was and then then things sort of echoed back to me uh, uh, from the Book of the Dead 
all these crazy little things that they did in the Book of the Dead or had the deceased do. All of a sudden, I saw elements of that in all of the little initiatory uh, initiatory steps. So uh, I took another look at the Book of the Dead and more or less figured, yes, this this is the pattern for for initiation. Well, an initiation is a test, actually. Um, again, on the on the exoteric level, going to university is is a kind of initiation. You, you study the course, you take a test, you pass the test, <clears throat> you get through the course. So initiation is exactly the same thing, but on an inner level rather than on an outer level. And in in societies that were that were structured and initiatic, these tests were formal. You did such and such a thing, and up to a certain stage actually we see that in the medieval system of apprentices journeymen masters same sort of thing you have to pass this particular test in order you're an apprentice for x number of years working for nothing and being taught and then you have you're given a particular test you pass it you're a journeyman mason or a journeyman weaver or whatever it is and then you get to a certain point and then still another test and a few become masters and that's like life uh, if you're playing the violin, it's one thing to play in the high school orchestra, another to play in the symphony orchestra, and then a few become soloists. Same process. A few become baseball players in the major leagues. It's the same process. It's just inner work as opposed to outer work. The Freemasons celebrate the parallel of the creation of the tower in the physical world and its creation in the inner, mental, or spiritual world. The metaphor of building and architecture embodied in Freemasonry shows the parallel path one takes to build both the tower outside of us and the tower within. This is one of many strong ties between the ancient Egyptians and modern Masons, as well as a number of other contemporary esoteric and fraternal societies. If you um, uh, go on a tour of, of great Masonic buildings of, of Europe and the United States, you'll see that uh, the architecture, the, the decorations and such in the door are decidedly Egyptian. If you go to the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., there's two big sphinxes out front and uh, winged solar disks and, uh, and such all over. So from a superficial point of view, Masons dig all things Egyptian. If you look at old trestle boards, uh, old uh, Masonic posters and such, uh, you'll see the pyramids and obelisks and sphinxes and, and such, even though the, their uh, myth is uh, of King Solomon's temple and biblical things and, and uh, that Phoenician style stuff. Nevertheless, it all translates Egyptian. Uh, the, the ceremony itself, by its uh, ceremonies of initiation, by its um, um, you know, format, follows the, the the pattern of where you're you're stopped you pass you have to overcome thing moving to the golden dawn now as a ma as a magical society that was proud to call itself a magical society um, founded 1888 in in london um, it just flat out was in your face egyptian the the officers wore nemesis and and uh, the lotus wands and 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 such and there's Egyptian god forms that was part of the, the regular mystical practice. Um, 
recognizing the fact that how many thousands of years have these God forms been impressed upon the consciousness of humans? Uh, other things uh, uh, in the Golden Dawn were, were Egyptian too. And uh, the, there was a vault, vault ceremony uh, where, uh, where literally an entombed Osiris, you know, gets up and has a little talk with you, which is quite impressive, I, I think. And uh, so it, it's had a lot of influence. Um, moving into uh, to Aleister Crowley, uh, who was a member of the Golden Dawn long enough to, to, to cause so much trouble that, that the whole thing fell apart. Uh, but his his initiatory uh, society, actually, there's a couple of them, but but his the core one, uh, which was an extension of this Golden Dawn uh, schema, and. Uh, the Golden Dawn degrees uh, were representative of higher forms of consciousness, progressively higher forms of consciousness, uh, but they didn't actually require you to achieve those levels of consciousness to attain those degrees. But it's, this is the pattern of what you're going to what you're going to do, you know, someday, you know. So, uh, but Crowley's thing was, nah, you're not those degrees unless you're experiencing the, that uh, that level of consciousness and uh, he just he just went hardcore Egyptian some of the, his uh, initiatory uh, oh just even the names of the, the initiations for that organization which are self initiations ultimately because ultimately all initiations are self initiated but Liber Pyramidos you know um, it's got an, another uh, another ritual that literally puts you in a boat, like like uh, you know Osiris, like the dead, like the Book of the Dead. And in order to do this ceremony properly, you have to have a lake and pylons that that and somebody rowing you to different things. Well, uh, it's pretty imp pretty impressive. Uh, so that's that's overtly. Uh, Egyptian too. So I would say um, with if we just go back in the history and w wipe Egypt out, it would pull a big plug on modern initiatory societies because there's not a heck of a lot of them out there dressing up like Hittites. <laughs> what is it about these ancient secret teachings that have made them so timeless and valuable, so sought after, so faithfully preserved? As the art of masonry and building provided a shelter in the shifting conditions of the seasons, these ancient lessons might be thought of as blueprints or templates that allow one to rise above the shifting conditions of the world outside. To build a permanent residence for oneself in the realm of the netto. To lift the mind to the consciousness out of the ever-shifting highs and lows of external circumstance and maintain a state of stability through the building and occupy of the temple within. These ancient teachings were blueprints for the creation of the inner town. The external stones represented the internal materia prima that is sculpted and formed into mental realm recreations of these principles, these houses of the letters. The temple is a masterpiece of mnemonic technology. The temple acted as a template. Its design mimicked the optimal 3D structure of the teachings it transmitted. Its symbolic and architectural components 
demonstrated the interconnectedness of its teachings and at the same time showed an ideal form for its internalization as a mental model of its revelations. Its form may have suggested the optimal structure of its recreation in the brain. Seen in this light, the temple has become an outward reflection, an icon, a symbol of the structure of an inner temple. The ancient secrets were often said to be lost to history, but if one knows where to look, the ancient secrets still burn brightly, preserved and protected in fraternal orders, esoteric societies, in the ageless wisdom teachings that are a legacy from the ancient Eastern cultures, in modern magical circles, in global shamanic practices, and encoded in many more unconventional and unexpected places. They're all over the place. <laughs> Maybe they've always been all over the place, but they've been too scared to, to come out of the closet. I don't think so. Uh, there's always been a magical movement. There's always been people that, that uh, uh, studied Western Hermeticism, considered themselves um, nominal this religion or nominal, that religion, but behind it all, um, they uh, at heart were, were magicians. Um, as far as pure numbers go in, in modern history, magic has never been more popular. There's a, there's a thriving golden dawn, um, all sorts of golden Dawns, different kinds of golden dawns if you're this religion or a golden dawn if you're that religion. Um, it's very popular. There's more information on the bookshelves than there ever has been. Some of it's pretty good. And uh, the Crowley's organization, which is probably the the most unlikely to be to become popular, you would you would think because of Crowley's uh, terrible reputation and the fact that uh, uh, it takes a great commitment and a little bit of courage to tackle Crowley's, uh, Crowley's work uh, and, and uh, get to a point where you understand that it's just as wholesome as, uh, as uh, anything else. It's scary, but it's wholesome, you know. Um, the, well, his uh, the outer organization, the Ordo Templi Orientis, has like 3,000 members uh, throughout the world in uh, over 20 countries. And, uh, the, and it's not because I think that, um, that the, the, the magic has changed or modernized itself or made itself more more understandable or accessible but because I truly think people have changed and sometimes I think uh, humanity changes slowly over a period of time sometimes it stays the same for a period of time but I truly think that uh, there are periods where we undergo leaps And I think we've just experienced a leap. I believe that one of those quantum leaps has just recently, recently taken place. Um, and it all has to do with our consciousness of our place in the universe. And it, um, it wasn't too long ago <clears throat> that we thought that, that the sun went around the earth and um, that the earth was flat and, and, all of, and all of that. Literally, we thought the sun died. Okay, for the, we thought the sun actually died every, every night. And uh, even, uh, even if we gave it a thought, you know, it's, well, it's gonna come up tomorrow because it did yesterday, you know. 
Dad said it always came up before, you know, so, but there was always this, this, uh, this uneasiness about it. And for many, many years, um, it was uh, in, in the hands of, of a priestcraft of every culture that, hey, we're the guys that make the sun come up, you know. So I know you're scared at night, but if you, you know, uh, follow our rules and pay our <laughs> taxes and feed us, you know, that sun's coming up tomorrow. And uh, so it wasn't all that long ago. And that dying sun thing that we all had in common with everyone else on the planet gave rise to the, 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 the fundamental religious forms of expression and our whole idea of the afterlife. Okay, the sun goes down at night. It doesn't go down, it dies. Okay, and I sort of die at night because I fall asleep. And so I'm sort of dead too. Not only that, I dream and I, there's light in my dreams. Where the heck does that light come from? It must come from that dead sun. Okay, and this must be that dead sun's world. And there's strange things happen. I even meet dead relatives there, <laughs> you know? And uh, so it's very easy to, to think that the dead sun rules the night and the dead sun rules the, the afterlife. Okay, so it's, it's just one little step uh, to, to thinking that when I die, I'm gonna be in charge or the guy in charge of me is going to be the dead, the dead son, and I'm going to have to, you know, follow, uh, follow his thing. That's Osiris in the underworld, okay, right in his boat, okay, and uh, and that's the the, the whole Christian, the, the Christian formula too, okay. Christ, like the sun, died, and like the sun, has to be ugabugged up in the morning. Uh, there has to be intervention of some kind to get that, get him up in the, uh, in the morning. So that, even though long after we learned that the, that the earth goes around like this and the sun's, you know, relatively stationary and, and such, we, we were still um, uh, dominated by this, this concept in the back of our heads, well, the sun really dies and just like my religion tells me my savior really died and had to had to come up Osiris had to come up Jesus had to come up and about 19 others you know in this in that same period have to come up but we've gotten to a place and you may uh, you know want to drag in the concept of yugas and and other things but just generally speaking this cut to the simplistic chase, most of us on the planet are now very comfortable with the fact that the earth goes around and the sun is stationary. The sun is staying on all the time. We've seen pictures of the earth being round. We've gone to the moon and seen pictures of the earth relative to this thing. The, the, Mankind as a whole knows that the sun does not die, the sun stays on all the time. And there, I think just recently, recently and within the last hundred years, let's say, recently something has clicked in all of us or something has clicked in enough of our collective consciousness that the sun never dies. The sun stays on all the time. And if it's nighttime, the sun's just shining on the other side of the world. We're just sitting in our own shadow. The sun stays on all the time. I stay on all the time. The sun doesn't die. I don't die. If it looks like I'm dead, I'm just standing in my own shadow. And I think that has clicked just, just recently. And so magic all of a sudden has a new improved formula. And the, the magical societies of today are now thrilled at this new little piece of the equation 
that has now improved our understanding of reality. We don't understand reality yet, <laughs> you know, but it's a little bit better than it was before, and all of a sudden, that's exciting. It's an exciting concept for religion, and it's, and it's an even more exciting concept for magic, because magic is an actual, actual use of, you have to get up off your, off your chair and do something instead of think about something uh, with this new improved formula. That's, I think, the Golden Dawn was, was sort of a, uh, uh, a preview of that. Crowley was sort of a flat out announcement of it. Uh, the, and the Masons, bless their hearts, uh, from probably medieval times. We're, we're trying to say, it's coming up, you guys. <laughs> you know, it's coming up. You know, there's something bigger than, than uh, uh, you know, this uh, knock you down, pick you up, knock you down, pick you up, die, come up, light, dark, light, dark. And just, you stay on all the time. It's a fundamental new realization of the continuity of existence. understand ourselves to be the materia prima, we begin to understand the necessity for purity and discipline. We understand hardship and resistance as a necessary phase of our higher becoming. Most importantly, we understand the constant attention required to nurture the fleeting new birth and to ultimately make it solidify into perfection, into permanence. The principles upon which Egypt was based are in fact eternal and by people who are conscious of what they are doing, it's not inconceivable that it can be reformulated in a manner that, that we can grasp, that we can access, and that we can manifest. There are many genuine teachers flourishing today, and along with, along with a healthy sprinkling of charlatans, but the ancient knowledge is in the process of reconstruction, of coagulate and it's not too much to hope for that in the not too distant future these the force that drove the hermetic societies or that drove them forward that kept them alive over 2,000 years of effective darkness will now see the light once again in a civilization wide renaissance and with a bit of luck the year 2050 will look very different from the year 2000 in, a, in an entirely beneficial and constructive way. Egypt, along with the other civilizations as well, the other ancient civilizations, but it's Egypt that we have access to. It's Egypt that in going through their temples and tombs and studying their pyramids, 
we get a living sense of how human beings, civilized human beings, once behaved. The science of perfecting of consciousness. The secret creation of the permanent and highly valuable philosopher's stone. This magical and arcane knowledge seems to perpetually fade from view, only to burst into incarnation again. Truly, this is one aspect of the powerful symbol of the phoenix, continually rising from its own ashes. At the temple of Karnak, the organic cycle of life is represented through the symbolism of the seed, which produces a tree that bears fruit, containing the seed for the next cycle. This relief may show... The ancient secrets of personal becoming, the mastery of circumstance, of the creation of a perfect vessel for immortal consciousness. The ancient secrets are often said to be lost to history. But if one knows where to look, the ancient secrets still burn brightly. The secret and ancient technology, known throughout history as magic, seems to direct us to the transformation of lower or base materials into higher, charcoal into a diamond, lead into gold. But since the beginnings of transmission of these secrets, their most precious application was to the materia prima of consciousness itself, our attention, our awareness, our intellect, our inspiration, our intuition, our individuality. Though the teachings and revelations of the past to be in their own way bound to the Osirian cycle of death and rebirth. The presence of the great teacher Thoth, the god of numbers and language, of thinking itself, links these teachings to a cycle seen in organic life. Thoth's deep wisdom found bloom in the pharaoh who is then able to write his own name in history. Karnak is itself a beautiful symbol for this cyclical rebirth, this perpetual unfolding of the sacred traditions and the secrets of magic. As the torch was passed to each new generation, the temple grew and evolved along with them. In each generation, the teaching would again flourish. The knowledge itself seems alive and subject to seasons of fertility, as well as long periods of hibernation. Throughout history, we see its cyclical re-emergence and its evolutionary influence on man. widely wasted, largely overlooked, and hardly regarded. The same laws that govern the perfection of the material world apply to the world of intellect or consciousness. We can create a diamond out of ourselves by following the same rules that apply to the perfection of any external material. 
This is one aspect of the deep secret of the Philosopher's Stone, the transmutation of our consciousness into an object of perfect, compact structure, high value, virtual impenetrability, and lustrous permanence. The body is the, is the temple in which the work takes place, and what does the work, or what has to do the work, is the con. In other words, that's our personalities. We have to decide, as our decision to make, whether or not we want to just mooch our way through life doing whatever it is that we do, or involve ourselves in this 